Welcome to PhD with Women on It Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young and today's PhD Positivity Hack delivered will be by our guest M. Stroud. Episode 30, 43 starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on Women on It, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startups and female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring hard to that hustle because empathy is my motto and empathy is critical when you are using laughter as the best medicine in today's episode we are going to learn why is laughter considered the best medicine an american actress once said you grow up the day you have your first real laugh at yourself this is a good reminder for us that life doesn't have to be taken seriously all the time. Focusing too much on something often takes away our objectivity, making us miss out on more important matters. In this episode of Positivity Hack Delivered, our guest is on a mission to get the world to laugh, think and play more. Emma, or I should say M. Stroud, runs mastermind groups for CEOs, MDs, and entrepreneurs. Her current creative production is an autobiographical film that was adapted from her sold-out theater show, Me M, Reframed, will be shown to the general public in 2022. M also writes regularly for various magazines and has been a featured expert on the BBC and ITV. Her podcast, Cloning Around, that was launched successfully in February last year, has garnered listeners worldwide and is now a top 30 podcast in the UK. She also has her TED talk, Be More Banana, which is the only TEDx talk where the speaker is dressed as a banana. So let's start with question M. What is the art of cloning? And this is something I found in your latest book. Hello. Well, it's lovely to be here, first and foremost. Thanks for having me. Uh, what is the art of clowning? Well, the art of clowning, there's firstly, lots of people are scared of clowns and you shouldn't be because clowns, we are the truth tellers. So I want you to kind of think of Shakespeare, you know, the Shakespearean fool or the court jester, something like that. And the art of clowning is really about expressing a part of you that perhaps you don't always let out to play. And as a clown, my job is with kindness to say what I see. And when I do that, and when I'm in that place of clowning, and I personally got three clowns, actually what it enables me to do is to find the wonder in the world, to find the joy in the world. And there really is a craft of amongst, you know, to become a successful clown. You know, I've studied it for years and actually clowning and understanding what clowning really is enabled me to, yeah, as you rightly said, write my first book, Lessons from a Clown, because actually to be a clown, you actually have to really know who you are. And so to be a truth teller and across the world, many, many, many cultures, clowns are massively revered. So I'm also on a bit of a mission to kind of get the word clown more understood rather than just being scary. Ooh. Find courage to show up for yourself and laugh every day. Can you tell us how to find courage and show up for yourself in, let's say, 30 seconds? Ooh, in 30 seconds, yeah. <laughs> to have courage to show up for yourself, then you've actually got to be brave enough to ask yourself some questions. You have to be brave enough to stop and really check in with what it is that you're doing and whether everything that you're doing on all of the different conveyor belts of life, whether that's truly making you happy. And if it is, brilliant. But if it's not, then you have to have the courage to then maybe stop, get off said conveyor belts and question where you are. And when you do that, my word, the world is possible. It's full of loads of different things. That's how I think you can really take, find the courage to look up who you are. Well, it's very philosophical, not much clowning around here. Um, I have to say, is it time for your tune from your podcast? Oh, is it I mean, always, you know, uh, the tune from the podcast, you know, it always, yes, I love please. that when somebody's like, it's like clowning around, clowning around, this is just us clowning around, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Go, yeah that is that is the theme tune you know to it and and that's the thing because you know within clowning there has to be a level of depth as well you know so it's this it's this beautiful thing of you know because with light there's dark and with dark there's light and that's why you know i'm fascinated by all of this stuff I have to say that you managed to go from the very serious talk now to really make me smile and I hope all the audience can join mm -hmm. in and uh, have a little bit of laugh and also reflect on uh, some serious stuff. Yep. Um, and uh, do you have, um, I, I was wondering, uh, um, because I remember uh, people were, uh, some some comedians were complaining about the fact that whenever they meet some strangers they are always asked can you tell me a joke <laughs> do you it, have the same problem it is a bit of a thing you know because if you do say that you do you know sort of comedy so i do improvising as well and i've done you know my theater shows are theater comedy so i tell stories and make people laugh um do i feel that pressure you know like when i was on a date and you know and things like that and going dating to make people laugh um it is a little bit odd when you're trying to meet somebody just as a human to a human and they go oh so you're funny what's your best joke and i'm like i don't actually tell jokes i tell stories and so there is a bit of a weird thing because it's like if you meet a plumber you're not going to go oh hi you're a plumber can you mend my tap it's not the first thing that you instantly say um but the whole thing is you know at my heart i am naturally uh, i'd like to think sort of a fun and kind of energetic being so hopefully if you spend a bit of time with me we will naturally just giggle a bit because you know that's got to be the light right absolutely and uh, i have to say that i remember when first time we met it was mm. 2018 i believe we yeah. were delivering some some speech uh, to leaders industry mm -hmm. leaders and uh, we had to make sure that these people the outcomes are not only about laughter also about how to get confident uh, how to be the leader of the future and i think you were challenging the audience a little bit I would like to think so, because for me, and this is well, it's exactly what you do as well, right? You know, that's why this yeah. exists is to help and to challenge people and to get us to think. And and for me, you know, what I found after, you know, doing speaking and working with in business for about 20 odd years or so, is that if you get people laughing, so they're open by the very nature, as soon as you're laughing, then actually, you know, you've got that lovely bit of chemistry going on, you feel better and all of that stuff. And then it's actually far easier, I find, to then help people go into a place which perhaps is slightly more uncomfortable. Because for me, I'm, I don't ask anybody to do anything I haven't done myself. And it is that thing of we have to be brave, you know, and if COVID hasn't taught us anything and when we're thinking about entrepreneurial journeys, we are already brave if you've been an entrepreneur. But in order to really kind of master that success and carry on, you have to keep looking at yourself because that's all we have. And I think that that's one of those things that I love doing with leaders is going, slow down, stop looking at the rest of the world and start looking more at you because ultimately that's all we can control, right? Absolutely. Well, um, what is a clown, really? That's another question that you're asking your audience in your book. Can you what tell us? It? Yeah, of course. A clown, we are the truth tellers. We are the people that see what is really going on and say it. We are the people that quite often will deliver the messages that nobody else has the courage or the permission. If you go back in time, one of the main things that history would say is that if you go back within the UK and especially within England and the courts, the court jester used to be able to say things that nobody else would have been able to do. In essence, that was the first real sort of clowns. And if you look across the world, there are clowns all around the world. And sometimes, as I said previously, there's a misconception about us. And for me, we're also the people that bring the joy and the light. And it's the childlike part of myself as an adult. It's not me trying to be a child. It's the childlike part of me that can see the wonder in the world, that can find the fun and the joy. And surely we all need a little bit more of that right now. Absolutely. Um, and I have to say that I was thinking about what kind of joke we could say at the beginning. And there is one, a stupid person laughs three times at a joke. Once when everyone else is laughing, a second time when he actually gets the joke, and a third time when he realizes 
he was laughing without getting the joke at first. So are stupid people not capable of laughing at jokes at first time? Wow. I mean, firstly, I, I don't think I'd ever like to call anybody stupid because that, that kind of goes against where my heart is lying. I think naturally, I think some of us don't, I think there are certain humor that we naturally relate to. And then there's other types of humor that we don't, which is brilliant, which is why there's so many different types of comedians. And I think quite often we could just be there and just go, I just don't get that joke. I just don't get it. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're stupid. It just means perhaps it was delivered in a way that doesn't connect to us. Because this is what makes us human, um, what makes us all so interesting, doesn't it? Because different Ooh. people will make all of us laugh in different ways. And so it's about understanding who makes you laugh and then also connecting with your own sense of humor um, and allowing yourself to do that, you know, and just giggle more, just basically giggle more. Giggling more is good. <laughs> and how to keep serious while giggling? I mean, especially women apparently have this concept of if we laugh or giggle more, we are less being taken less seriously. Is that the truth? Or did you um, have biased perception of your making jokes in the office? Um, I think naturally, I think us women, I think we... We haven't had so many role models, and I think that's a big part of it. We haven't had, up until probably the last 10 or 15 years, there's been very few female comedians and funny women up on stage. And I think that's changing. I think that's changing around Europe. I definitely know it's changed within the UK. So I think when we're at work, I think there is still a reticence um, for any of us, whether female or male, because we're worried we might offend, or is this being sort of too silly, or can we be, you know, now I'm not suggesting at work, we all need to be comedians, I'm not suggesting that, but what we can all do is we can bring a, a lightness of touch, we can bring a levity, we can bring a smile, we can bring that human connection, even online, you know, there's different ways by just maybe just allowing ourselves to play a little bit more at the start of a meeting, just actually engage and become present. That brings a lightness. And then throughout what might be a very serious and very important meeting. Now remember, I work with the CEOs of some of the biggest businesses in the world, entrepreneurs around the world that are turning over millions of pounds and employing lots of people. But the reason they come and work with me is because they're curious of how can they find that lightness of touch because we spend a lot of time at work so it shouldn't always be serious and somewhere along the line we got this memo that in order to be successful and be very career we must be serious and i'm like i don't think that's true i think when we allow ourselves to be all of ourselves then actually we're far more likely to succeed and for me Yes, a lot of that is about laughter. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to suddenly share loads of banter or you suddenly have to become a joke teller. It's just about allowing the human connection and really allowing that levity and that lightness, which then naturally does lead to laughter. And that's surely got to be a good thing because we only get one crack at work, you know, at life. So surely when we're at work, we want to be enjoying ourselves just a little bit as well. Yeah, absolutely. So German philosopher Nietzsche once wrote, man alone suffers so excruciatingly in the world that he was compelled to invent laughter. Well, there is nothing better than a word from depressed philosopher. But when we are talking about uh, the paradox of sad clown paradox, and this is something that is was discovered uh, some some time ago in 1981 fisher uh, did um experiment psychological experiment uh, which was published and indicated certain behavioral traits exclusive to comedians and not much in regular actors later work conducted by kaufman reinterpreted these results drawing the understanding that whilst comedy serves as a cop coping mechanism to hide trauma, it may also motivate a comedian to use humor as a way of forming relations and gaining acceptance. Were they correct, Em? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, having a lived experience rather than sitting and doing lots of research, which is valid and has its place. I think we all make decisions about where we're going in our life 
Uh, and I think we all start wanting to do what makes our heart sing. You know, I think, especially as entrepreneurs, I think we set up businesses because we feel passionate and we found a solution to a problem, for example. I think lots of comedians and yes, lots of performers and lots of clowns have stories and have good lives and also have had traumatic lives. And I think one thing that does link anybody that chooses to stand up on stage is that they have a curiosity and they have a curiosity to see how their words or their acts or their performances could change others. And that, of course, and I go back to my truth teller part with the clown, that is also because we're also looking at our own narrative and our own story. Do I think that every comedian is coming from some traumatic background? No. Do I think that there are some of us that have come from a traumatic background? Yes. Just the same as they are in life, generally. Um, and I think when I hear kind of research like that, it's, it's one of those things of... I think when people are going into something with the right intention, then that will always come out. And I think that's the case, whether it's entrepreneurship, being a creative, whether it's a performer or a comedian. And of course, yeah, it is, it is. I'm not gonna lie, it is a very useful thing in terms of building rapport to be able to make people giggle because as soon as you do that, as I said earlier, you kind of open up the more human connection side of it. So is it a useful skill to be able to make people laugh? Hell yes, it's very good. But is it is it the be all and end all? Is that the only way that I connect with people? No. And I think mm. there are lots of performers that then are just genuinely fascinated about telling stories. And we need those people that tell stories through music, through art, creatives, because that's how we all connect with each other as well. Um, so I, I don't disagree. I don't agree with that research. I think for me, it's all about just always just taking a moment and checking in with what makes your heart sing. Absolutely. I was uh, shocked with uh, what happened to Robin Williams, because I think everybody uh was shocked to see a great comedian that was really deep down suffering with depression we have a first very kind um message from olga love that ethel barrymore quotation you grow up the day you have the first real laugh at yourself so we love that as well we have another quotation from dame judy dench I think you should take your job seriously, but not yourself. That is the best combination. Mm. How not to take yourself too seriously? Um, and we'll move on to um, to in love and in pain next. Um, I think it's I think it's about really just taking a moment. Um, and before you click join or you click, uh, you know, connect or whatever, just taking a moment and just going, how do I want to show up? You know, because I think quite often we're a bit on autopilot and it's a bit like join another meeting, join another meeting, join another meeting, join another meeting, get some tea, join another meeting, join another meeting. You get the idea, right? And actually what I find so that we don't take ourselves too seriously, it's like allow yourself to get up and move and create a five minute space play some music, dance around, do things like that. Break your own state. So because I think in business, we get really caught up in must be very serious, must get to my outcome, must do that. And of course, that's got a place. But actually around it, what we can do is we can find little pockets, little moments of joy, you know, so it could be, uh, yeah, playing some music in your kitchen, having a little dance around. It could be picking up some juggling balls. It could be going on YouTube and watching someone that makes you laugh. Just these little, little pockets a, they'll fuel you. B, you'll feel better. And then you'll just be like, oh, cool. And then you can chat to the person you're having a meeting with. You go, oh, I just watched this great video. Have a little giggle. You connect. The relationship then gets deeper, more human, and it's far more likely you're going to get the outcome that you want. So I think just really being conscious just to take a moment and think, how do I want to show up? I think that really helps in terms of keeping the lightness of the day rather than going, soon it's going to be the end of the day, then I've got to feed the kids or whatever it might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have got the question from in love and in pain. I was trying to get to change her name, but clearly uh, I failed. Let's say, uh, let's see what she says. Nice to see you again, Beata. Hi, Em. How to move on from painful experiences of the past truthfully i think for me and my own journey it's been about really creating a team around me and i'm not just talking about my friends and my family 
I'm talking about allowing myself. And I think as women, we can be very bad at this. I myself was very bad at this in my sort of early, late 20s, early 30s. And in order to move on anything, any any things that are painful, and I have had my fair share of them and write about it and talk about it. And, you know, and in my film and my shows, I talk about being suicidal sort of 10 years ago and things like that. And honestly, it's about allowing yourself space to be held by other people. Ooh, there's people beeping. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. It's about, it's about allowing being heckled from afar. Somebody's beeping in Malta. It's very exciting. Um, but honestly, it's the biggest gift that I've given myself has been allowing myself to take the time to get support and, and support when I was in a really good place. So my life and business was going pretty well. And that was the time that I started to really look at some of the things that had happened to me when I was a kid. And actually, as soon as you do that and you start owning it and you start talking about it, then actually you can't help but the body move stuff, you know, then it's no longer in my body. And the other thing for me, truthfully, my journey has been reconnecting with clowning, which I started again about five years ago. That reminded me about the joy and the wonder. And when you're being reminded of the joy and the wonder, you can then choose to look at it, you know, just as opposed to looking at the dark. So I hope that helps. So honestly, get support, talk, be brave, do that. And then it's quite extraordinary where you can find yourself. You can actually be really happy. Who knew? Well, uh, there is also a laughter yoga where mm -hmm. there was. Uh, yeah. I've heard about it. Did you try it? I've done it a couple of times. Um, there's laughter workshops, there's laughter yoga. And if you're thinking, what a ridiculous idea, because I don't know what I'm going to laugh about, it is contagious. It's a bit like yawning. So you will literally be lying there and then somebody will start to chuckle and you'll just be like, <laughs> and then before you know it, you're like, why am I? I don't know why I'm laughing. And you will genuinely spend about 40 odd minutes laughing and it is in your body and you giggle and it is the most and because laughter has rhythms if you think about any comedy show you can't laugh out loud for the whole time because it would just be too exhausting yeah. and that's the same when you do laughter excuse me when you do laughter workshops it is brilliant because you will just literally have this whole journey of laughter and you leave and it feels like it, it's it's one of the most cathartic things I think I've ever done so if you've got it wherever you're watching the world google laughter workshop and weirdly they do work online as well, which in these COVID times is quite a useful thing, right? Absolutely. Well, we all definitely remember the time that we were laughing uh, so much that it hurt. When was the last time you laughed so much? And what made you laugh? <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty lucky soul. I laugh quite a lot. But um, actually, last night I was I was with my some of my oldest and dearest friends. So um, I was very lucky. I went to uni and made some amazing friends. And we had our little Christmas dinner with, with some of us last night. And there was one moment where we were genuinely crying with laughter. We, none of us were drinking. Everybody thought we were very drunk because because we were just laughing and it was over something really silly. So I have pockets and I'm very lucky and I've surrounded myself with people that also make me laugh. So literally last night, um, oh, and that being said, and also like <laughs> I was listening back, you know, as you do, well, you know, I was listening back to my podcast and my last guest, um, Mandy Hickson, who's a, an ex tornado fighter pilot and now is a public speaker and stuff. She has the most contagious laugh I think I've ever heard. And I was listening back to the episode as it went live and literally was crying with laughter at her laugh. So yeah, I mean, I laugh a lot. I, you know, it would be a bit weird wanting to make you know, the world laugh and complain more if I didn't do it myself. So I laugh a lot. That's good. That's great to know. Um, so what are your techniques? I know laughing yoga or workshop or whatever tickles your fancy. Of course, it's not going to work every time, right? Mm. What are some of the techniques that help you generate the positive mood that you need? To generate... I guess with a positive mood, it there's there's some really key things that I've really learned. Um, first one is really about my own sense of self-care. So mm. I know this sounds really daft, but I think especially those of us, you know, we all run businesses, right? And actually when we run businesses and then we've got families and we've got friends, everything like that, quite often our own sense of self-care can be quite low. And actually, one of the things that I think is really important in order to be in a good place, both mentally and physically and spiritually, 
So you've got to look after yourself. You've got to have really good self-care. So I've worked really hard on my self-care practices. So, you know, sort of exercising, meditating, writing. Yes, having a team M around me of like a therapist, a massage person. So those things are super important. Um, I also think, honestly, I, I'm very prudent and I'm very proactive with how I choose to live my life because as entrepreneurs right we get to choose what goes on in our diary not the other way around so for me it's about being proactive in terms of right okay here's a creative day here's a admin bit of my time and I really needed that structure so that I could then fly there's no way I would write a show write a book do a podcast if I didn't have that so I kind of get to look at my diary and just go woohoo because I'm like brilliant that day I'm doing that and then this day I'm doing that so in essence I think in order to kind of be coming from it from a really good place it's just about making sure that you've set yourself up your whole life not just your work but your whole life so you're fueling you um and i've got this thing that i talk about in my book called the rainbow diary which is in essence a very simple color coding system which enables my whole life to make sure that i'm doing the things that make my heart sing uh and then that that just enables me to, you know, 90, 90, 95% of the time, be a pretty happy little human being, which is good. I am little, by the way, I'm five foot two and a half. So I really am short. <laughs> okay, well, let's look back at the cover of your book. And uh, there is another question I wanted to ask you because I think there is this perception of laughter or cloning or clowning around is not really um, a business word, is it? I mean, it's not really a business word. I I mean, the thing is, the whole idea about clowning around um, is a whole idea for me. It's about finding fun and joy, and it's about being curious. And I think the people that I know that are super successful in business are curious, and people that are really successful in business allow there to be fun and joy. So yeah, at the moment in traditional business, you know, you sort of say clowning around clowns, having fun, that doesn't equate to business. And I'm like, why not? It's humans that do business, it's people that do business. And there is a whole load of evidence that actually if people are happy, if they're laughing, if they've got really good self-care, if they're finding the joy in their life, they will be more, uh, they'll be happier, they'll be healthier, they'll be more productive, they'll be more successful. So anybody that really says to me, ah, oh, but Em, I don't think that there's merit in that. Firstly, I don't think that they really believe it. I think they're just scared of what that might mean to them in, in terms of a business culture. And like I've said to this before, um, like I said to this before, it's like, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything in business suddenly has to be comedic. I am merely suggesting that we just need to have more fun, more light and more laughter, which will make us more successful in those more serious bits. It's about creating that journey rather than just keeping it all at, we are very serious. And if you're watching and thinking, yeah, but that's not true for me. I have worked with some of the top law firms, financial firms, the big banks in the world. I've worked with charities, tech firm, healthcare companies. And the evidence that they witness when they allow this, it is that change because people do business. And somehow as adults, I think we forgot that actually we only get one crack at life. So enjoying mm. what we do surely has to be important. Well, it reminds me uh, my visit to uh, the insurance company and the lady who was talking with a straight face about insuring um, the house together with the horse and somehow she didn't find it funny when uh, my husband answered i don't like my horse messing with my stake staircase so it's definitely making an impact when you've got somebody reacting at your jokes or at least finding a funny side of life we've got olga questioning you mentioned university friends um, does this mean you didn't go to clone school? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Olga, for asking the question. I've actually done both. Uh, so there you go. Oh. Who knew? Yeah, I, I went to university and studied theatre and performance studies and media. Uh, and then I went to drama school. Um, and while I was at university, I went over to Italy and I did study Commedia dell'arte, which links into clowning. Uh, and then I went to drama school for three years later on. And then I have then since then been to clown school. So I 
have friends from all different parts of my life, clown school, university, and drama school. So do not worry, I am I am fully trained in this. So you can feel safe in my hands that I've got the academic background, but also the practical thing. Oh yes, thanks Olga. <laughs> I thought that when you're clowning around, you need to have this uh, kind of spark and uh, be always improvising. Is that the case or is there a set of jokes that you have always at your hand? Um, I am an improviser by train by training. So I've improvised uh, shows for, gosh, 20 odd years and I've spoken to literally tens of thousands of people about how improvising is a vital skill in business um do i have jokes do i do i have jokes uh, no no not at all what i do have when i'm doing the impro shows where we're creating stuff off the top of our head um what i do have there is i have certain things that I know will work, but ultimately improvisation is about listening and responding. It's about listening and responding. And it's not about having the one quick liner because when you have the one quick liner that actually kills off any scene. So actually what you want to be able to do as a really good improviser is listen and respond and then accept the offers that your other players are giving you and then you build on it. Um, so no, I don't, I don't have in my back pocket. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got some material that I've used from my shows but they're theatre shows. I'm a storyteller, like I said at the start. Um, so no, I don't. If you're looking for a joke teller, I'm not the person. I'm definitely. I literally, my son knows more jokes than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should uh, take him to the show uh, one day. Uh, let's go back to the kind of office environment and business uh, structure. While hum humor can create positive energy in teams mm -hmm. and help to improve leaders' likability, humor can also destroy a manager's credibility, prevent them from being taken seriously, and sometimes even offend people. What should be avoided to be taken seriously? Well, again, this comes back down to the intention behind it. And I always really think that if you're a manager and you're trying to be funny because you think you should, everyone's going to feel that. One of my real bugbears in work, and I've worked with some of the top speakers around the world, is when you see somebody that isn't naturally comedic, isn't naturally funny, and you can see they're like, to break the ice, I should say a joke. And they say a joke, everybody sits there stony face, and then they're like, right, now onto the real thing. And that's what I think happens when managers try and do something that isn't true to themselves. That's when the offense can come. That's when the awkwardness can come. So if you're watching this and you're just thinking, not really naturally that funny a human being, then it's not about trying to be funny. It's just about finding the lightness. And I go back to that word levity. I think all of us can find the lightness and the levity in touch. And if you're naturally someone that does like to tell stories, that does make like plain jokes, then yeah, then then do it. But if that isn't you, everyone will feel that. And having worked with so many people like, oh, Em, but I want to be funny. And I'm like, are you funny? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, it's not going to work then, is it? What's what's your superpower? Actually, I'm really calm and I'm brilliant under pressure. I'm like, brilliant. Let's play with that. Because I am all about making sure that everybody is the best version of themselves, not trying to replicate me, but to be the best version of, of themselves. I think there is an importance that we don't take ourselves too seriously. And if we do that, then we're not going to offend people. You know, it's all about the intention behind stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the guilty pleasure of watching The Office and feeling mm. cringeworthy moments and also not quite getting the gist of uh, why uh, would some managers um, behave like that. So we've got a next question from Veronica. Hi, Em. <laughs> Having a laugh and tales finding positivity in things, which is hard sometimes. What is your advice to people who are having a hard time being positive and finding something to laugh about? I, I really hear you and I think it's a really fair question. I think sometimes, and especially with where we're all living through at the moment, you know, I think it can be really tough to find the light and find the joy. And I think if you're in a place where perhaps you're feeling really sad or you're feeling really low, trying to force that within itself can actually then make you feel worse rather than better. So one of the things that I'd always advise people to do is on those days, don't try and push for something 
it's just about allowing tiny little moments of maybe being curious of, I wonder what it would feel like if I really noticed the beautiful winter sky light, for example. I wonder what it would feel like if I let myself read one of my favorite poems. I wonder what it would feel like. And it's very much coming from that place of wonder. One of the main things for me is we have to be kind to ourselves. And I think sometimes if you're having a hard time, actually acknowledging right now I'm slightly struggling, that within itself will then start to shift you towards being able to find the light and the joy and the humor. So for me, it's about baby steps, not trying to express, you know, not trying to expect ourselves to be able to do everything really well and really, oh, I've got to be positive all the time, because that's not real life. It's impossible to be positive all the time. But what it is possible to do is to allow ourselves to be curious. And I just go, I wonder if this might make me feel better. And sometimes just as simple as going, you know what, I'm going to really savor this cup of tea and actually really taste it. That sometimes could be all of the light that you're going to get in one day. But you know what, for those two minutes while you're drinking your tea, that might be just all you need. Absolutely. Enjoy that positivity i mean she's good she's on fire isn't she she's bringing out she's bringing out the big guns people she's bringing out the unicorn dog you know i, can't, I, can't, I, can't I need pain. all the help that i can get sister yes so, there you go so um i remember in 2018 as well it was just before COVID, so I was oblivious to what is going to happen next. And I enjoyed the uh, Women in Tech conference in March, 8th mm -hmm. of March, 2019. 10th of March was the time that Monta announced a lockdown. So I was lucky enough to make it before the lockdown back to country. But I remember this conference in particularly because um, the lady was telling us about leadership and laughter. And she told me something that kind of made me stop and freeze. Because um, women can encounter sexual remarks or inappropriate comments about physical appearance. Um, and she actually talked about the guy who said some sexual uh, comment and she said, uh, you know, um, she said the best answer is actually ask something, you know, you're so ugly that I wouldn't like to be uh, your girlfriend, something like that. And I thought, you know what, after the Me Too movement, maybe not, that's not the best approach. Maybe we should stop in the track. And I actually said, I wouldn't like to have sexual joke in my office, I would rather be somebody who's maybe not liked, but somebody who is going to stop sexual jokes, and which is partly kind of sexual harassment joke that was. What would be your advice? I think with everything, I go back to the kindness piece, right? Um, so with that, that lady sort of coming back with some, in essence, heckle back at that man, when you use that as an example, that doesn't sit with me at all. Because to go back like with like, it just doesn't, no one is winning in that situation. The audience isn't winning, she's not winning, he's not winning, and it doesn't work. I think if we are at any of those points, um, if anybody, whether a woman or a man, um, is feeling uncomfortable or sexually harassed, then it has to be met with the seriousness that it, that it merits. And it's not about dismissing it. And the thing that I find is that sometimes when people are uncomfortable, they will use humor as a distraction method because actually they're uncomfortable. And one of the things that I've witnessed in the workplace now, as we shift and we become more inclusive, hopefully, and more diverse, is you just have to call it out. And if you see something or you hear something, you have to have the courage to go, this is how this has made me feel. Because if you're coming at it from your perspective, there is no finger pointing, as I just demonstrated there with my fingers. In case you didn't know what finger pointing is, there it is. <laughs> But for hey. me, it's really important to frame it from a linguistic perspective to go, hearing you say that to that person or to myself has made me feel really sad and really uncomfortable because actually I feel slightly X, Y, and Z. And as soon as you do that, what you do is you take away all of the challenge because you're not saying they're wrong 
And they might have meant something as a bit of banter, it might have been completely harmless, but you instantly deflate what could be an inflated situation. So for me, at those points, not using humour has massive weight, but using it very much from, from my perspective, this is how you've made me feel, rather than some accusationary thing. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, if I'm being heckled and I'm on a comedy stage and somebody is heckling, I can give as good as I get. But that is mm. in that situation and that is a sort of, there's an acceptable arena of banter you know, of like, wow, you're really short. I'm like, tell me something I don't know. Brilliant. You know, there's all of those <laughs> things, right? But mm. at work, that's not the place for that. At work, it's that time where you just take a breath and like I say, you go, this is how this made me feel. Mm. I, I would advise uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you hear a joke that is aimed at vulnerable people, whether it's your partner, whether it's your colleague, female colleague, or somebody in your office, it's always worth it to say, would you say it to your daughter? Or would you like to hear it? Somebody say it to your mother or somebody in your family? I'm sure they will have time to reflect on that. I mean, there is no way to be combative and have this battle of uh, jokes which may not lead to something nice so definitely am i agree with you that's the best approach years ago education explicitly told young girls and women to quickly quickly learn to smile defer to boys be neat and speak only when being spoken to this would open women up conversations and allow those around them to feel comfortable as long as women abided by those two simple rules, they could easily embody the golden standard of what it meant to be a woman. What it's like nowadays, what it's like in UK. I mean, I mean the standard jokes uh, from UK are quite sarcastic. What it's like to be a female working in an office now? Well, I mean, if you're asking me that, you're probably asking the wrong person because I don't really work in an office. Um, I mean, wherever that quote came from, I mean, I, I go back and I can see there's a couple of questions that we will definitely come to. Um, Marianne, I, I love your question. I definitely would love to answer it. Um, wherever that quote came from, I'd like to think it sort of that reminds me of back in the sort of the 18th century when women didn't really have a place to speak. So we used to have fans. And there was a whole thing about the language of fans. So you would be fanning yourself. And depending what you did with your fan dictated whether you liked a lady or you didn't like a lady, or whether you <laughs> fancied this gentleman or not, you know, I don't actually have a fan in my office. But it would be like, Oh, no, I like that man. <laughs> or I like this man over there. And there used to be and that quote that you've just said sounds like we've gone back to about the 17th century honestly I mean I think I think as women I really would like to think that in 2021 nearly 2022 you know what you can be who you want to be and I I spent a lot of my life and for those of you that have seen my TED talk I I even spoke about it in my TED talk I I was invited to this big entrepreneurial uh, awards thing up in the city in London and I got really kind of like oh I need to be properly girly I'm not properly girly it's not me right um but I thought I bought a suit and I bought heels and I bought a handbag and I made my quiff down because I was like, oh, that's what they should want me to be. And I remember I walked into that event and I disappeared. And then I went down in the lift because it was just at the top of the big building and I was still smoking at that time. And I sat outside and I had a cigarette and I promised myself I was never going to hide myself again. And I, and that's, I don't know, 10, 10, 12 years ago now. And I would really like to think that women and women that are joining the office world and the business world now can show up and be themselves. And if they're not, then it's down to people like you and me to make sure that that gets changed. Amen, sister. Let's go into question with Marianne. Good to see you, Em. How to stay happy when people around you are sad? I think it's a really tricky thing um, and I think and it's really human because especially us women we can be empaths and we can pick up you know all of these different energies and stuff and that's the time when I go back to being team team M you know there will always be certain points where there are people around you that are sad and actually that's when you have to really invest in you and make sure you up your self-care so that you don't get pulled into someone else's narrative and then what you can do by being truly happy and being truly okay, 
then actually what you then are is a bit of a beacon of light for those people that are perhaps feeling sad. And they might say, Marianne, how come you're okay? And you'd be like, well, actually, I'm really looking after myself. I'm sleeping well. I'm eating well. I'm exercising. I've got a great therapist. I've got a great coach. And actually, that's really helping me be okay. And that might be the one thing. By you being the best you, that might shift them or not. Um, I also think, truthfully, I think if you are hanging around with a lot of people that are making you sad, then you have to reach out to other people that aren't in that, that headspace because naturally, eventually, you are going to get brought down. So it's how who we choose to hang out with, who we choose to give our energy to, it's just being really conscious of that. And of course, everybody, you know, we all have people that we know and love that sometimes will be sad. And that's different. You know, we have different peaks, right, and troughs. But if you're around a lot of people with a lot of sadness, then just maybe be a bit braver and just maybe take yourself and create little pockets of joy with new people. Pockets of joy, that's fascinating. What is that? Pockets of joy, um, just little things that make your heart sing, you know, little kind of pick me ups, um, anything from, you know, it could be as simple as I'm making, my, I'm going to sound very British now, but making a very lovely cup of tea, pocket of joy. It mm. could be, okay, it's a Thursday, I'm allowed my little cake, pocket of joy. It could be, mm. I'm going to play my favourite bit of music, pocket of joy. It doesn't have to be big. You know, you can yeah. also do the bigger things, you know, especially, you know, you can do the whole, I'm going to go travelling by, you know, there are the bigger things to do. But every day we can allow ourselves little pockets of joy, which then punctuate perhaps the harder things of life. But also we can find pockets of joy in simple things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just like I'm saying, you know, it is. it doesn't have to be big things. It can be making tea, mm. a cup of, uh, you yeah. know, a really nice cake, um, you know, or going for a walk as opposed to just sitting and just doing emails. It doesn't, doesn't have to be deep and meaningful or expensive. It can be very small little things, right? Yeah, I I have to say that having a 21 years old daughter, it's quite difficult for me to explain to her that she doesn't need that instant gratification. She can enjoy just a simple gratifying things like, you know, she's done her homework right or whatever it was, small achievements she achieved or woke up and uh, got up and get herself out of bed. That's uh, also a little pocket of joy. Absolutely. Right. Um, let's go um, to the fear of being forgotten, the, which is apparently present anxiety amongst comedians, that their popularity may disappear tomorrow, and hence they are really driven to exhaustion in their work. Does it happen to you? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. There you go. Probably no. next question would be, uh, yeah. do you have imposter syndrome? And you would uh, equally answer no, right? I have had it in the past. <gasps> My Definitely. goodness. I don't, I don't in think the in the past. Any, yeah, in the past. I, I don't, I think, I think I would be, yeah, I don't know of anybody that at a certain point in their life hasn't had complete imposter syndrome. You know, when you stand up somewhere and you go, oh, you know, and I think, you know, since we've met, I'm now a lot more comfortable with saying I'm a clown and a performer and that I work, you know, in business and do shows. And I'm really grounded in that. But the first few times I started to say stuff like that, I was so worried about the response of others. And I remember doing one gig to a, a room of unbelievably senior people at an unbelievably well-known and very big brand and I just watched this unbelievably good speaker before me and I just sat there and just went what am I doing here I am a clown I am a comedy performer the woman in front of me is professor this professor that she's cited all of this research and knowledge and she's a brilliant speaker and she's funny and now it's me and I had to have a little word with myself at that moment and just went I can't try and be anything other than me. And actually, I've just got to go and be me. So, I, yeah, I definitely have had that imposter syndrome. Um, and I think it's I think it makes us all human to sometimes question, you know, should I be here? Am I good enough? What am I doing? But I've worked really hard so that I don't have it anymore. You're good enough to be on our show, sister. So let's <laughs> move on to, <laughs> to the next Thing from your book quotation your life is very busy always so very busy 
How do you shift from busy to productive? Um, I go back to what I said earlier about the rainbow diary. I think I think we talk a lot about being very busy. And I think sometimes it can almost be a badge of honor of like, how are you? We are really busy, really busy, great, really busy. And I'm always a bit like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And for me, especially as women juggling lots of different things, I think for me, I don't like using the phrase busy. I prefer to use the word, my life is really full and it's full of things that I've chosen to do. And actually, as soon as you change that, there's a different in the energy and there's a different in how I feel about it. So again, this choice of language, and I guess this is something that you do have from doing comedy and improvising and clowning. The choice of language is very key, right? And so if you tell yourself, right, actually, my life is really full, then actually what you're doing is going, but I have chosen to do this. I have chosen this. And then it's just so then about kind of going, how do I want my whole life to look? Okay, I've got time in my business there. I've got time with my daughter there. I've got time with my partner there. I've got fun and curiosity there. I've got this there. I've got exercise there. And it's just about, for me, it's about going, how do I want the here and now to be? And maybe the next few days, because that's ultimately all we can control. So for me, it's a, a change in language and it's about being very proactive in choosing how I spend my time. Fantastic. Very full life. Is it fulfilling life, though? Yeah, I've got a great life. <laughs> Bye -bye. Got a great life now. It's like, but it's taken me a long time, you know, and it is, you know, like I said, you know, this is why I'm chatting on the show, because... I've worked really hard to get to this place, you know, where I am, I am living, you know, a creative life. I am living my fulfilled life. I've written a book. I never thought I'd write a book, had loads of things to jump through that. I'm dyslexic, was told I wasn't very good at writing. I've got a podcast that's going really well. I've got business, part, you know, I've got loads of cool stuff. I've got a son that likes me. I like him. I've got a missus that likes me. I like her, you know, so it's I've got a great dog who unfortunately had to go downstairs before we started going live because he just didn't want to sit still. Um, but I've worked really hard to get to this place and I will continue to have to work hard at it. But when I say work, I've, I've kind of got to a place where I'm just like, how can I be the best of me? And that's always going to be something evolving. You know, I'm always going to have a team of people around me asking me smart questions. I'm always going to have moments where I'm deeply scared about the next new thing that I'm doing. Um, I mean, I've just started making a film, never made a film before. And I went to the, and I've made the trailer of the film and I went to a film festival for the first time. And it was terrifying because I'd never been to a film festival as a producer and it was about my story. And that's the thing. It's about how do I keep myself moving so that I can be the best of me? And I'm going to be imperfect and I'm going to mess up and I'm going to have some days when I'm sad and some days where I'm really happy. But that that within itself is living and I don't want to exist. I really feel like you said the word fulfilled. For me, fulfillment is that you're living all of it and you're feeling all of it. And that's where I'm at now, which I feel unbelievably grateful for being at that place. Fabulous. Uh, do you, and I had this question once, do you consider yourself successful? Uh, yeah, I do now. Um, mm. And it's not about success from perhaps external things. It's not about success about how... I think traditionally the world looks at success in terms of nice car, nice house, regular holidays, amount of money in my bank statement. It's nothing. I've learned that that doesn't really mean anything. I, you know, I've had businesses fail, so I've lost a lot of money. I've made lots of money. And actually for me, success, well, success is the fact that I can sit here at what time is it? 5.45 UK time and own the fact that I'm a clown and that I'm a business person and that I'm me and that I'm gay and that I'm a mum and that I can just show up and I can be all of me. That to me is success because my younger self wouldn't have been able to do that. My younger self would have been must put on masks and make sure I'm very professional or must be this or must be that. And actually now, yeah, because I just show up and I'm me all the time. I'm not no different wherever I am. So if that is how you view success, then yeah, I am. I guess. So um, I presume the advice uh, that you would give other females to help their career or start an entrepreneurial journey was, would be be yourself or is there any other advice? 
be yourself, get, ask for more help than you think you need. Don't think you can do it all by yourself. And if there is one thing that I've definitely, definitely learned, um, there's a really great guy, he's, he's called Dr. Gay Hendricks, and he's written something like 70 books. The, the guy is amazing. He's, you know, very good friends with Oprah Winfrey. And I got to interview him on my podcast a little while ago, which was, which was really cool. And he's got a book called The Big Leap. And in The Big mm. Leap, very simply, he's like, operate in your zone of genius. So do the thing that you're really, really good at and everything else get other people to do. And I used to fight that. I used to be like, I should be able to do everything because it's my business and I'm an entrepreneur. I should be able to do everything. Mm. No, no, not possible. This, what I'm doing right now, this is what I'm good at. You know, writing, creating stuff, chatting to people, coaching, masterminding, all of that stuff. That's what I'm good at. Admin, all of that other stuff, systems, processes, not my skill set. I can do it, but it's not my skill set. And if you are thinking of setting up your own business and you think you can't afford to get support, get support. Because if they're good at their support, the money will come back because you're doing what you're really good at. So honestly, anybody that is thinking about doing that, that's been my biggest learning thing of like, don't try and do it all yourself. Focus on what you're really good at and then create an amazing team around you, whether employed or freelancer. That's just a different thing, right? Right. It's like Confucius uh, saying, do the things you love doing and you will never have to work. Yep. Right. What is a number one book you can sit and think, oh, I wish I read it before I started my career? Um, probably that one. And just because it's now really in my head as well. Um, yeah, I really wish I'd read The Big Leap um, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Um, mm. because of how, and if you like audiobooks, Gay Hendricks himself narrates it and he's got a beautiful speaking voice. So if you like audiobooks, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because I love, he kind of helped me realize that actually it's okay to do the stuff that you're really good at and stop trying to be really good at everything else. And he was like, focus on, because I think quite often in business, we can focus so much on our weaknesses and actually he's like, focus on your strengths, do stuff that's really good, do that and everything else will flow. Um, so probably that book, yeah. Mm, fabulous. Are you working on any exciting new project right now? Uh, yeah, well, I'm just, as I said, I, um, I've made the trailer of my first film. And so uh, we're just getting investment. So that should be coming through in quarter one. Um, so next year, shall be making my first full feature film. That's quite exciting. Really? Um, I'm also also about to start my um, start writing my second book. So that's quite exciting. And I'm also just formulating um, and launching the, the global movement um, of Laugh, Think, Play. So I've got some amazing business partners. This is what I mean. I can't do it all. Um, so we're going to be launching Laugh, Think, Play properly next year. So yeah, I've got quite a cool, quite a few little cool things in the pipeline. Yeah, it's very full life indeed. What is your life lesson quote? And can you share how that was relevant to you in your life? Um, I will have to bear me one second. It requires some change here. <laughs> you can see it on my oh. arm here. Yes. I have a few tattoos on there. It says this will change. Yes. And it was my first tattoo. I have four or five now. And I got this from... Uh, Vipassana, which is a 10 day silent meditation retreat. Now you've all just watched me for an hour. I'm quite chatty. And this was 10 days of complete silence. And one of the lessons from the teacher was that everything changes. And, and he said, you know, this will change. And it's true. The saddest, the hardest moments, that will change. The happiest, the most joyful moments, that will change. And it has always kept me grounded and kept me because it's on my arm just going enjoy this moment because this moment will change but there's something very beautiful for me about that message and not getting too fixated at, at what any one moment and as soon as we realize that we could be having the best success that could change you could get more you could be having the biggest failure but that could change and as soon as you realize that, then suddenly it's quite easy not to get so attached to stuff. And then that, for me, helps keep the lightness. And the laughter, too. Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> right. 
Let's go to our favorite question about imagine the pandemic is over and you can invite any person in the world to have private breakfast anywhere in the world. Who would you invite and where would you go to? Um, um, I, I sort of when I saw this on the kind of the list of questions, I was like, oh, God, I don't know who I'm going to say, because um, there's loads of people that I'd love to have breakfast. But I'm just going to say the person that that really came into my head when I was like, OK, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to meet Pink. Um, just because I think oh. she is the most amazing performer. Um, and I think when you look at her career and how she has maintained a career, I love her kind of viewpoint and how she's done things and how she speaks up for lots of different parts of communities. So probably Pink. Um, and where, uh, you know what, I'd, I'd quite like to do somewhere let me just think somewhere really lovely and warm let's go with um a really beautiful beautiful island um like hawaii let's go there just because that just feels really nice as it's really dark and cold so meeting pink for breakfast in hawaii if you could sort that out that would be ideal thank you okay and we can sing together cloning around on hawaii with the little you know <laughs> Flowers and everything. I exactly. Can, exactly. I can imagine that happening anytime yeah. soon. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. Provided uh, you can travel from UK. It, exactly. Them. Once once we sort All out the nightmare that is the UK, yes. then we'll be allowed to travel. You know. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's been a pleasure. This is the end of our show. Thank you so much for, for keeping me. us laughing. And to stay updated and ensure you never miss a Positivity Hug Deliver, follow women on IT and turn on notifications to be alerted once a video has been published. Tell people and they may forget. Show them, they may remember, but involve them in the laughter and they will understand. Not exactly what Confucius said, but I'm sure he had that in mind as well. When you focus on the positives, the positives get more positive. As always, our positivity quote comes from positive thinking and goes, look for something positive in each day, even if some days you have to look a little harder. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude, Maya Angelou says. Today is your day to hug the future, hug the positivity you want. Thank you.